Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 5, Natural Deduction in Propositional Logic. In this short video, we'll explore five more logically equivalent propositions to enhance our ability to prove or demonstrate validity in natural language arguments using propositional logic. This is the last video in this series on propositional logic for Philosophy 103. Now, in our last video, we learned about five logically equivalent propositions that we demonstrated with truth tables and labeled replacement rules, because they allow us to replace any given proposition in an argument or proof for a logically equivalent proposition that we need in order to demonstrate that the argument as a whole is in fact a valid deduction. That's the goal in this logical game, to show that a given argument in natural language is a valid deduction without having to resort to using truth tables. Of course, if the argument is valid, we should be able to demonstrate it using either method. It's just that truth tables can be very cumbersome, especially if there's more than three simple propositions making up the argument. And the longer the truth table becomes, the easier it is to make calculation errors throwing off our results. Inference and replacement rules are shortcuts. They help us to achieve the same results, but with much less work. And in logic, we prefer the simplest possible solution to a puzzle. Whether we call it the principle of parsimony, or Occam's razor, or maybe it's just the case that logicians are lazy, whatever, there's no reason for us to do more work than is necessary. In this final video in our series on propositional logic, we're going to explore five more logical equivalencies and add them to our toolbox for validating symbolized deductive arguments. We've already learned that a tautology is any statement that must be true in all possible worlds. As it turns out, the conjunction or disjunction of any proposition to itself will form a tautology, and so we can adopt these forms as replacement rules for propositional logic. Now, thus far, all our replacement rules have either dealt with conjunction or disjunction, but in this final video we'll explore some rules that include conditional statements. For example, there's transposition, which shows us that any material implication will be logically equivalent to a denial of the necessary and sufficient conditions asserted in a hypothetical claim. Exportation is a rule that shows us that if we have a conjunction as a sufficient condition for some consequent, that conjunction will be equivalent to a material implication as the sufficient condition for the same consequent. Material equivalency is perhaps one of the most intuitive of our ten replacement rules, since it shows us that the phrase if and only if means that we have a biconditional relationship, or a two-way conditional statement, where the propositions are both necessary and sufficient conditions for each other. We'll conclude by looking at material implication, which is probably the least intuitive of our replacement rules, but we'll demonstrate that it holds nonetheless. Now, the simplest way to understand the replacement rule of tautology is by comparing it to our understanding of the concept of redundancy. If something is redundant, then you don't need it. This is exactly what this replacement rule is telling us. If I take any proposition and conjunct or disjunct it to itself, I've added no new information, so the addition of the second assertion isn't necessary at all. It's redundant. If, for example, I assert that Cato was a dog, and then add, oh, by the way, Cato was also a dog, I've introduced no new information, so I didn't need the addendum in the first place. It's a redundant statement. Let's start by looking at a truth table to compare P or P with P and P. It's a short matrix, because we only have one statement to work with, and we know that it can only have two possible truth values. It's either going to be true, or it's going to be false. So, having exhausted all the possible orientations of truth values, and determining the truth functions of our true two propositions, we see that these two propositions are, in fact, logically equivalent. Now, let's pause and just think about these two propositions for a moment. Suppose I wanted to derive P 
from P or P. I don't have an inference rule which would allow me to get there. But if P or P is logically equivalent to P and P, I could now employ simplification in order to derive P. But I don't even have to do that much work. It turns out that the proposition P is logically equivalent to both of the other expressions, meaning that we can exchange them at any time we need. We can now derive P in just one step. And we can do exactly the same thing for P and P, even though we could have done that using simplification. What we've discovered is that P and P, or P or P, are redundant expressions, and so we can exchange them at any time. Now, if you've been paying attention throughout this exploration of propositional logic, you'll recall that we learned to use the term tautology to refer to any proposition that is logically true. That is, it's true in all possible worlds. But notice that on these truth tables, we do not have tautological statements as we defined them earlier. So what gives? Why are we calling them tautologists when they are clearly contingent propositions? After all, we can clearly see on the truth table P or P and P and P are both true just in case the simple proposition P is true and they're false when P is false. But let's think about this. What we're saying is that if P is the case, then P or P will be the case. If we set up and work a truth table for that proposition, notice what happens. We get a tautology, a statement that is logically true or true in all possible worlds, even the world where P is actually false. It will now surely come as no surprise that if we were to do exactly the same thing for if P, then P and P, we'll get the same result. So we've discovered that if P, then P or P, and if P, then P and P, are both tautologies. Each one of them is true in all possible worlds. But hold on to your hats. Watch what happens when we conjunct those two tautologies. This is why we label this replacement rule tautology. Our next replacement rule is really easy to grasp since we already understand the idea of necessary and sufficient conditions, but just in case you don't remember, let's have a little refresher. A necessary condition is any condition without which an event cannot occur. A sufficient condition, on the other hand, is any condition or set of conditions that, by themselves, will bring in about an event. It will ensure that an event will happen. For example, being exposed to a rhinovirus is a necessary condition for catching a cold because you can't get that particular illness unless you've been exposed. It's a viral infection. However, being exposed to a rhinovirus is not a sufficient condition for catching a cold. After all, you might be able to fight off the infection. A sufficient condition in our current analogy would be to both be exposed to the virus and have a significantly compromised immune system. If you're exposed to the virus and you can't fight it off, you'll get sick. Or take the example of fire. It's a necessary condition that oxygen be present in order to get combustion. Oxygen is a necessary condition for fire. But just because oxygen is present doesn't mean there'll be a fire. So oxygen is necessary, but not sufficient for fire. In order to remember the relationship between necessary and sufficient conditions, always think of the sun. S-U-N. Sufficient, then necessary. The antecedent of a material implication is a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent is a necessary condition 
for the antecedent. So the sum will always make things clear. Transposition tells us that if p then q is logically equivalent to if it's not the case that q, then it's not the case that p. This is basically the same thing we learned with modus tollens. If we deny the necessary condition, we must also deny the sufficient condition. If there's fire, then there must be oxygen present, but if there's no oxygen, there certainly cannot be fire. A quick truth table will demonstrate the logical equivalency of these two propositions, just in case there's any doubt. So, what we've learned is that we can always substitute if it's not the case that Q, then it's not the case that P, for if P, then Q, and of course, vice versa. The logical equivalency we call exportation is also really intuitive. If my car is in good working order and I hit the ignition, then it will start, is really the same exact thing as saying if my car is in good working order, then if I hit the ignition, then it will start. Let's set this up on a truth table to see it in action. Suppose I say, if I'm exposed to a rhinovirus and my immune system is compromised, is a sufficient condition for catching a cold, that's the same thing as saying, if I'm exposed to a rhinovirus and if my immune system is compromised, then I'll catch cold. These two propositions are logically equivalent and easy to understand. One logical operator we've not explored in terms of inference or replacement rules is the biconditional, symbolized by the triple bar. But the material equivalence relationship does exactly that. If we say P, if and only if Q, what we're really asserting is that P is both a necessary and sufficient condition for Q and vice versa. This is precisely why we call this operator a biconditional. It's a two-way material implication. P is a sufficient condition for Q, and Q is a sufficient condition for P. So the biconditional is two material implications in one. But there's another way of expressing a biconditional relationship. If P and Q are necessary and sufficient for each other, then either we have both of them or we'll have neither of them. Of course, we know that a disjunction is often inclusive. It allows for the possibility that both elements in the disjunction are true. But when expressing biconditionality, the disjunction becomes exclusive. As we can clearly see on the truth table, P and Q, and it's not the case that P, and it's not the case that Q, cannot both be true at the same time. Either we have them both, or we don't have either one of them. They are exclusive, which is exactly what P, if and only if, Q is telling us. It's really nice that so many of our rules in propositional logic are intuitive. With just a minor amount of reflection, we can see that they should be true. Then, of course, all we have to do is lay out the proof in the form of a truth table to make sure. But not all logical equivalencies work that way. By now, we have a firm grasp of material implication as a logical operator and the relationship between sufficient and necessary conditions. We've learned how to deploy it in modus ponens and modus tollens also in hypothetical syllogisms, as well as the three new logical equivalencies we've just covered. But it also turns out that the old familiar if p then q has a not-so-intuitive logical equivalence. It's not the case that p or q. Now, I've been studying philosophy for almost 40 years, and I've yet to find anyone who can give a simple, intuitively appealing explanation of the logical equivalence that we call material implication. Now, maybe it's just that I'm thick and that's entirely possible, but I've yet to hear a really good explanation. So you know what? 
I'm not even going to try to offer you an intuitive appealing example. After all, sometimes things turn out to be the case regardless of whether or not they seem to be true. In fact, sometimes things that are true are quite contrary to our intuitive understanding of the world. And that's one of the reasons why we look to logic in the first place, and don't just depend upon our intuitive understanding of the world all the time. Sometimes, in order to get to the truth, we have to struggle against our intuitions as hard as that may be. So for this last logical equivalence, I'm going to ask you to try, as best you can, to turn off your natural desire to intuitively grasp this logical relationship. Instead, I want you to focus on what the truth table tells us, and what must be the case. One of the most difficult things for new pilots to learn is to trust their instruments instead of their senses. There are countless documented cases of new pilots flying blind into cloud cover, refusing to believe their attitude indicator, and making minor adjustments while they fly until they find themselves flying out of the clouds upside down. Pilots have to learn to ignore what their intuition is telling them, and to trust the instruments. That's what I'm asking you to do with material implication. We know that truth tables are reliable. If we set them up correctly, we can flawlessly compute the truth function of any compound proposition, as well as prove some argument forms to be valid. We therefore know that these two propositions are logically equivalent because we've just demonstrated that it's the case, even if we don't grasp why it's the case with our intuition. So, as Obi-Wan said to Luke, let go of your feelings and trust the truth table. In the last two videos, we've learned about ten logical equivalencies that we've given names so that we can use them as shorthand rules in validating ordinary language deductive arguments in propositional or sentential logic. Along with your eight valid argument forms, or inference rules, you're now well prepared to evaluate complex deductive arguments for validity. Of course, unlike Aristotle's syllogistic rules, these are not exclusive. There are many logically equivalent propositions, and a large variety of valid deductive arguments. What we've explored in this series of videos are some of the most common forms, which provide us a kind of shortcut in examining the deductive arguments we encounter. And determining validity is of course only the first step, as we well know. We also have the far more difficult task of determining if the premises of the valid arguments we encounter are in fact true. That raises a whole new set of challenges in the field we call epistemology, the philosophical investigation of knowledge. What is knowledge? Can we have it? And if so, how? But those are questions for another video. So for now, I'll say farewell, and we'll see you in our next set of videos on inductive reasoning. So be sure to come back again for a little bit of logic.